she, ready for that? No, she started the recording, and then she's going to switch um, to us to be the organizer. Okay. All right, you guys are now presenters. I am going to get started. I will say um, I'll click start broadcast, and I'll get us started about one minute after. Great. Oh, perfect. I can see your slides. Awesome. Yay. Just a heads up, this is what people will see right now, so don't yeah, I've paused it. anything private up. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've paused sharing, so I'll start as soon okay. as we start. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. I'm going to make an announcement in a minute, and then we'll get started about one after. Great. I just don't want to be like jumping in and out of the process all the time. Make Android do something. I have a touch screen radar. I have a touch screen radar. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will begin in a few minutes. We're just waiting for some people to make it into the room after they finish their lunches. So if you sit tight, we'll begin in about three minutes. Thank you.
Welcome everyone. My name is Alexis Carlin. I'm the Digital Marketing and Operations Manager for Percussion Software. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Beat the Google Game, How to Boost Your SEO with Mobile Performance Optimization. To begin, I would like to just mention a few housekeeping notes. If you'd like to live tweet, the Twitter tag for today's webinar is webperf. The slides will be emailed to you after today's presentation and available on percussion.com. And there will be time for Q&A post-webinar. So please type your questions into the chat window and we would be happy to answer them afterwards. I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker. Ari Wheel has been working on optimizing applications his entire career and is currently director of products for Yoda. He's been a DBSC product manager and evangelist for companies including Wachovia and Quest Software. He likes to unwind by impersonating a jungle gym for his kids. Percussion software is the next generation in web content management. Percussion transforms how you manage content, making it easier than ever to accelerate your content marketing initiatives. Percussion software is used by AIDS.gov, Lancaster Bible College, Mass.gov, Sunoco, and Vegas.com. You can learn more about our products on percussion.com. With that, take it away, Ari. Thanks, Alexis. Hi, everybody. Um, so we're going to go through these slides, and I'm going to try to do it so that we have plenty of time at the end for Q&A. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the question window just in case I see something I can layer in while I'm speaking. Otherwise, as Alexis mentioned, I will address questions at the end of the talk. So let's get started. Um, beating the Google game is something that is of constant interest to pretty much everybody that has a web presence, which is increasingly nearly every business uh, across the globe and across pretty much every market segment. And we've seen numbers like you see here. A 7% loss in conversions can result from a one-second drop in page speed and 11% fewer page views would be realized, or a 16% drop in customer satisfaction would occur. But what most people don't really internalize is just how often that metric can apply holistically. It's not just your desktop destination site that is important. It's not just your home page or your landing pages. It's the entire experience that your customer base, that your prospective users, that any visitor to your site will experience that's really impacted by this metric. And so when you look at mobile, and when you consider what Google is doing recently to try to encourage, um, with the cattle prod, companies to improve their users' mobile experience, they're saying that it's no longer okay for you to focus on all of your SEO optimization and performance optimization for desktop context, and to basically phone in, pun intended, the optimizations that you would apply to a mobile site. So let's talk about a little bit why you would care about this and how you can actually beat uh, Google's game, which is actually just doing the best possible job for your visitors and for your end user customers. The mobile market is enormous and it's growing incredibly quickly. If you look at the average number of different devices that companies have to manage, that's one way to get your arms around the complexity. Another is to just look at the amount of time that's spent on mobile for mobile commerce or for really any other segment that's growing, including just basic productivity applications and reading the news. But if we focus specifically on commerce and e-commerce and mobile commerce, there will be a half a billion shoppers using mobile commerce platforms by 2016. 71% of smartphone users currently shop on their mobile devices, and nearly 50% of the time spent shopping, that's not 50% of the actual conversions that occur or purchases that you realize, but the time spent is spent on mobile devices. To drill down a little bit further still, Apparel and accessories, just one small sub-segment, sub actually sold a billion dollars in Q1 of 2013 in mobile alone. But the problem is, when you try to focus on your mobile site and when you realize just how much people are currently using your website on a mobile device, you have to realize what the user is actually experiencing on their end. So for example, if you have a desktop solution and you wanted to create a mobile one, first of all, you don't have to do anything to create it because you have one by default. Mobile browsers can connect to any website. And if you're not specifically redirecting people to a different location or providing them with an alternative via an application or some other distinct URL, 
then they are browsing your desktop site on a desktop, uh, your desktop site on a mobile solution today. In fact, when we looked at some information that came from Google's own an analysis and research, we 35% of people, when given the option, will actually choose to browse your full site on a mobile device, primarily because of the challenges uh, that they realize from using mobile solutions as they've been architected up until this point. So 41% of people, for example, simply think that there is a huge security vulnerability shopping for mobile. 51% to navigate and use. 46 say the product images are too small, and 26% feel the checkout is frustrating. You can basically eliminate the top and the bottom as mobile-specific objections. 41% of people will always be concerned about security. That's why we have EV certificates that turn our browser bars green to let people know that it's safe to buy from our site. That's why we have Better Business Bureau uh, you know, labels and badges up on our sites and things of that nature. And the checkout process being frustrating is also something that is a, a universal concern for any sort of an e-commerce platform. However, one of the things that you can realize is with the middle two and even considering the final point, if you take your current site and you shrink so that it fits into a viewport that's arguably about 20% of the size of a desktop monitor, then you can understand why it would be hard to navigate and use the site. When you plan your navigation around maybe a different orientation, so if, if you know, your users are the type of person who would hold a phone uh, vertically instead of horizontally, then your navigation is arguably not going to fit on the screen by default. If you've taken your site and simply shrunken it by 80%, then your small thumbnail images for your product catalog, for example, will probably look like something on an eye chart to the average user. They simply won't be able to see it. And despite you know, how interesting it is to be able to sort of pinch and zoom using your fingers on a phone, people don't want to have to do that to consume your site. So the checkout process being frustrating is the last point is also one thing that's exacerbated by mobile solutions. And that is because the last mile networks that people use to connect to your origin servers using their mobile devices are shaky. The kind of connections are shaky. Uh, the way that the technology is architected will constantly reduce signal for certain people or drop calls based on volume or simply moving around and being mobile with your mobile device can incur network switching uh, uh, situations where basically any disconnect from your application could lead to all sorts of bad behavior. Um, so the long and the short of it is what Google is saying to you is that users demand a better mobile browsing to actually realizing that experience. And so are other things like design, like graphics, like third-party widgets and social integration. There's absolutely no doubt that those are the critical elements of any site that wants to attract marketing attention or conversions from customers. But really, if the user's waiting for all of those eye-catching graphics and cool social integrations to actually show up on the screen, and that's impacting their ability to consume your site, then it's having exactly the opposite effect that you intended. And that's important, because when you realize the way that people will behave when they have a poor experience, it can actually be rather frightening. So 85% of users out of the gate expect a mobile site to be faster, because the going assumption is that you will have stripped out any of the unnecessary content or style sheet or media that the mobile user doesn't need to download on their device. So the going sort of uh, logic around that is they know that I'm on a smaller device that has less horsepower than my desktop device, therefore they will have adjusted their solution to run well on my phone. Uh, very oftentimes that's not true. 57% of people will experience problems on your mobile commerce site relative to browsing from a desktop. 29% of those people will wait a year to return to your site. So they may give you another chance, but they're going to assume that it'll take you time to fix things if you fix them at all. And that's why an equivalent number, another 29%, will never return to your site. Now the scarier metric is that 42% of people will actually go to your competitor. So if you drill in a little bit more, 85% of people expect your mobile site to be faster, but 64% of those people think that your mobile solution will load in less than four seconds. Now for anybody that's ever been traveling through a city like New York or San Francisco, or you know, pick whichever carrier you don't like. If you've ever used AT&T or Verizon and you don't like that network, then think about your connectivity when you use that phone. But you know, sort of all tongue in cheek aside, four seconds is a difficult bar for a lot of desktop sites, let alone a mobile device that has issues with turning on and using the radio, issues with the amount of CPU that's available to download images onto the phone, 
and also the basic fact that mobile browsers behave differently than desktop browsers, which is something that I'll drill into in a little bit. But if you look at some of the other challenges, so let's say that your site does load in four seconds. Network latency overhead, just the fact of connecting to the network and starting to download content to your phone is one second, on average. And that's an average, which means that it can consistently be higher than that. It can also be shorter, but more likely that it'll be longer. So if your user expects your site to download, lost one second of that time simply by making a connection. Now, if you take this to the opposite extreme, where eight seconds is sort of this, this high watermark rule of thumb for your site must load faster than this, users will only spend 1% of their time looking at ads. If that's a material source of your revenue, then you can imagine the impact that you'll have if your page is taking that long to load and your users aren't consuming your ads. What's probably going to happen is the inverse of what you wanted, which is users going out and using social media to tweet about or post to Facebook or post to LinkedIn about the negative experience they had. And that sort of organic reach is actually much more destructive and much greater. The average tweet will reach 400 people. So if somebody says, they had a bad experience on your site, that's going out to a network of 400 people. If any of those people retweet that or go check and then tweet to their own group, you have an exponential growth in the amount of bad publicity you get just based on the fact that your site was slow to load. Now to, more, uh, to complicate that even further, consider the fact that users actually perceive sites to be 15% slower than they are. And that comes down to something that, that we refer to and most people refer to in, in slightly different connotations as context. So the context could be how the user is actually physically using the phone and what they're doing. So for example, if anybody commutes to work using public transportation, uh, you know what it's like sometimes to get onto or off of a train or a bus or a subway. Uh, it's a push and pull sort of experience. People are moving quickly. They've got their heads down. And if you're anything like me, you're trying to get through as many of your emails as possible so that when you get to the office, you can just fully start your day. Well, if I'm in that frame of mind, I am not going to be very tolerant of a site that's loading slowly, and I will absolutely perceive it to be loading slower than it is. Now, the same is true for all sorts of other things. If I want to buy something and I'm just trying to convert through a shopping cart, watching the spinner is going to seem like watching water boil or watching paint dry. It's going to seem like it's taking a lot longer than it truly is. So that's something that you have to factor in whenever you're, you're gauging uh, the scope of a performance. Um, the other thing that you have to consider is you need to be capable. So, for example, Google Analytics or Omniture are two very popular ways that people gauge how people are using their sites and where they need to improve the experience. If you look at the demographics for people who are using your site and you don't have at least 10% of your traffic coming from mobile, that could, first of all, be an indication that you have a lot of work to do because you're missing out on an entire market that's growing exponentially all the time. But you could also realize that your users simply don't want to or need to concern your service over a mobile device. And if that's the case, then it really doesn't make sense to focus on uh, mobile optimization, in which case you can just really focus on having the best desktop experience or other product offering that you can. But the reality is that the majority of businesses will require a mobile solution. And so you really have to factor in how much of an impact you're going to have maximizing the mobile application or mobile website experience versus something else that would have a larger impact. Um, and there are numerous examples of companies that have done just this, where they considered, for example, um, having additional items available for download from their main desktop site, or having a mobile solution that was basically just a collection of helpful links or downloads that a user could take and browse offline from their mobile device. So that really is an important and implementation-specific question that you should ask before you do anything else. And then, once you've decided, for the sake of argument and because you're listening to this webinar, that you do have work to do for a mobile solution, you have to start with testing. So the first thing that you do is try to leverage an existing, available, and free service to test your website performance. There are numerous solutions out there today. Web page test is arguably the most popular and one of the best. Uh, Yoda has a solution that's very similar called website test, and there are numerous other solutions available on the market. But one of the things that this will allow you to do, and the reason that I'm highlighting this capability is because really anybody can leverage this part of web page test. You don't have to be technical. You don't have to be a marketer. You really just have to have eyes and understand a left to right progression. When you look at what it looks like to load your site on this film strip, basically what the tool is doing is it's taking screenshots of the page load process at predefined intervals. 
And so what you can see very clearly is how long it takes before a user sees something on your site. This is hugely more impactful and more accurate than trying to do the timing yourself, even if you were to sit in front of your machine with a stopwatch. It doesn't take the place of real testing. It doesn't take the place of you doing your own individual testing on your own devices. But it is a far more scientific and statistically accurate way for you to understand what's happening. And frankly, it's a lot easier. So you go to one of these websites, you enter your URL, and it will show you exactly how long it takes to load a page. It can also give you an incredible amount of detailed insight. And web page test and Yoda Zone solutions also will support this mobile specific implementation. So you can, you can specify, for example, mobile devices, mobile viewport sizes, and mobile last mile networks so that you really are getting an indication of what a user is experiencing from their mobile device. And what you look for here is intuitive and visual as well. What are the longest bars? What are the bars that are pushing all of the other bars further to the right? The further to the right your waterfall cascades, the longer it's taking for a user to interact with your page. Now, there are a few different metrics that you can look at here, and they're highlighted in colors on this page. But I want to focus on a few of them. So, Time to first byte, the one that's in neon green, is simply the amount of time it takes for you to connect and begin downloading content. Oftentimes, there's not an awful lot that you'll want to do to maximize that process. If you're having a problem with connection, either DNS connection or origin server connection, or the first byte download time, oftentimes you're going to want to focus on just wholesale purchasing and improvement to your infrastructure. It's not a do-it-yourself thing. It's not often something that's going to really warrant spending a lot of money for a, a detailed tuning exercise to tune your infrastructure. It's not universally true, but if you are using, for example, a framework like Drupal Commerce or Magento or Demandware, you're probably not going to want to focus on these areas. The platform should really handle that for you. Uh, or you can go to a hosting provider for one of those platforms who will assist you. What you want to find here is the time to display and the time to interact that's showed on these waterfalls. The time to display is exactly what it sounds like. It's almost visually complete. It's the time that your user can actually see the content of your page and begin to consume it in any sort of a reasonable way. There's time to start render, which is another metric that people look at, but that's really when somebody starts to see the screen painting. Users expect the majority of the above the fold content at a minimum before they consider a page displayed, and that's really what you want to focus on for that four second time budget. Time to interact is another metric that's important. We have a, a SaaS solution that's really dependent on every page element loading before you can use the page. Salesforce would be an example of this for anybody who's in sales or marketing. You can't really use Salesforce until the whole page loads. But if I go to, for example, Amazon.com, and especially if I'm looking for a given product, I'll be able to see that product image and the descriptions and maybe some of the review data long before the entire page is completed. And that's really what's important to the user. It's how fast they can begin to, to consume the content that they came to you in order to consume. So the first thing you need to do is, is address monitoring. Whether you do individual one-off tests or set up a scheduled monitoring solution is really going to be up to your own personal preference uh, and the level to which you're drilling into this. But running individual tests to get some good indications of the performance of your site is absolutely critical. And really focusing on more of the front end, more of the JavaScript and image rendering and HTML rendering is really what you should focus on, and not so much the infrastructure related issues where you can very inexpensively today buy yourself out of that problem. Now, some of the other things that Google has been talking about specifically for the way that they're optimizing or penalizing you for mobile SEO. One of them is eliminating errors and making sure that you manage your traffic correctly. If you're doing this wrong, then you're actually going to be fighting against yourself in as much as, as SEO is concerned on a mobile device. So blocking malware and adware is important to maintain scalability and uptime. It helps you avoid denial of service attacks. It helps you avoid people hacking your site and, and either doing something destructive or, or otherwise impacting your customer's experience on your site. But there's useful crawlers and there's useful bots as well like the Google bot, the Yahoo bot, the Bing bot, all of the ones that will crawl your site in order to index your site better for search engines. What you really want to do for these crawlers is to A, make sure that you're not blocking them as malicious content or malicious crawlers. The other thing that you want to make sure that you do though, if possible, and there are solutions like Yoda out there that will allow you to do this, is to serve them cached content. Because a bot is not a real person. 
They don't know if you've loaded personalized content. They don't know if you've loaded up social information or local information. It really doesn't matter. What they're looking for is you have keywords that can be found via search, and then a page can be linked that they can navigate to. Does that page have errors? Does that page load quickly? Do the subsequent links on those pages actually lead to other good links that aren't just redirects or broken links in themselves? And so allowing the Googlebot is something that absolutely makes sense, but moreover, it makes sense to ensure that what Googlebot sees is the fastest possible experience that has no errors associated with it. Errors lower quality and lower utility for a site. It's a long-standing rule of thumb for anybody who's worked with Google, and despite trying to come up with really interesting and funny 404 pages when you do have an error on your website, your time would be better spent trying to make sure that you simply don't have these errors. So for example, a 403, your server is actively rejecting connections. 404, there is no resource available. Or a 500, there's just something wrong with your infrastructure. From an end user perspective, especially if they're going to an e-commerce site, trying to convert and actually purchase something and giving you their credit card information, nobody wants to see these errors during the checkout process. And in fact, if they see them during the shopping cart process, or even a certificate-related error where your certificate doesn't match your site, you are far less likely to convert that customer and far more likely to actually lose that person for at least a year or probably forever. Now, what leads to some of these errors? Well, living and dying by copying and pasting. So uh, as Alexis mentioned, I started off my career in, in optimizing applications as a developer, a database administrator, and then an operations guy. This is basically all I did. And with the bad behavior when I was developing, people taught me how easy it was to copy and paste existing code to get there faster. And then I slowly realized as I was a DBA and then an operations guy, just how destructive and dangerous copying and pasting could be. And so this is something of a soapbox for me. But what we see online and what we see with a lot of our customers here at Yoda, and especially where a mobile solution is concerned, because a lot less focus has historically been paid to mobile and it's been more of a just get it working as quickly as possible sort of an initiative is copy and paste errors. So for example, I want to create, instead of my www desktop site, an m.mobile site. In order to do that, I may copy over the content that I assume is the most important to my mobile users so that I can address the problem of not loading up as heavy or as broad a site onto a mobile device as I would on a desktop site. Assumptions are incredibly dangerous. You assume that you what your visitors may want to browse, but the further assumption that you can take an existing desktop page and simply apply it to a mobile site is a really poor assumption. And here are some reasons why. Gzip, which is a way that you can compress all of the content of a page and is very effective as a front-end optimization technique, can actually be mislabeled when you simply copy and paste you may not actually be applying Jesus to a page. So in, for all intents and purposes, you looked at that page, it would look as though it were being compressed, but the copy and paste directly, and in fact, no compression is being applied to the page at all. The result is a bloated page that takes longer to download and longer to render for your user. Another one is media that's incorrectly tagged. So browsers are getting more intelligent all the time, especially mobile browsers, where all of the major browser development vendors are trying to have the most robust browser that can have the best possible experience on mobile. And I'm sure many people have seen it. OSX just uh, upgraded to Mavericks, and one of the things that they're talking about is all of the improvements to Safari and then mobile Safari. Google is constantly updating Chrome and mobile Chrome. Uh, and the same thing with Opera and the Dolphin browser and many of these other ones. But when you incorrectly tag media, basically what you're doing is you're telling the browser that something is a type of media that it, it's not. And so if there's any special handling, at the best, you're going to have some superfluous logic executed that doesn't have to be executed. At the worst, you may have styles applied incorrectly or, or actual bad behavior in the browser itself when it's rendering the content because it will apply rules to media that are applied absolutely incorrectly for what's actually being rendered. And the last one that I'll just drill into deeply is going to be the unnecessary third-party assets. So one great example of this is a style sheet. A lot of solutions implementers, a lot of consultants, and even a lot of just internal development folks will take their CSS files, their style sheets that define what their pages are going to look like to the end user, and roll them forward from project to project to project. The result of that is you end up with a snowball effect. You started out with a relatively concise CSS file that only had the rules that applied to your first initiative. 
When you wanted to start the second initiative, instead of starting from scratch, it was easier to take that CSS file and copy it over and then build upon it from there, and so on and so forth, until you end up with this sprawling document that has a lot of individual um, uh, uh, references to sizing and to style that are simply irrelevant for the current site. Those are not free. It's not like it's just superfluous comments in a code file. This is something that makes the file larger, that takes the, the browser longer to download, or the device longer to download, and the, the browser longer to render. There's front-end optimization techniques that can take multiple files and combine them. It can strip out all of the superfluous, and you say superfluous in quotes here, comments and spaces that make it human readable and easy to debug, and make it as small and compact as possible so the browser has an easier time rendering it. But you're fighting against yourself if you're constantly including other assets that you simply don't need on any given page. So what you should consider when you're thinking about optimizing for search engine bots, eliminating 404s, and really maximizing the efficiency of the pages you download is whether or not you have the budget and the time or even the internal skills to do it yourself. Most often the answer to that is, is no, or at least it should be no. You really should be considering what are the things that you can and should be doing that are going to move you further faster? And typically that is not going to be do-it-yourself front-end optimization work. There are a lot of projects out there that are available in open source, and there are a lot of paid SaaS solutions that will do a lot of this for you. And again, Yoda is clearly one of those. But what you can do with a service for a little bit of money is typically a lot better investment than trying to do it all yourself. It's less error-prone and it'll let you just basically innovate and compete much, much better. Remember that it's important to do this because you're really trying to maximize your reach. You're trying to maximize your conversions. And so when you're weighing the pros and cons of any sort of an optimization project, and especially when you're considering doing it yourself, you have to think about how that is going to impact all of your other initiatives for e-commerce, for conversions, for all of your marketing goals, uh, when you would have a problem or when doing it yourself might delay the implementation of things and impact the rollout of other competitive features. And is the traffic uh, shaping and the errors are not really something that you can just address once and then leave. This is a constant process. So just like you're constantly going into Google Analytics or Omniture to understand the reach of your marketing and e-commerce campaigns, you need to be looking for any errors that might arise as you're upgrading your website or as your website is simply growing organically over time. And the same thing with traffic. You have to be aware of who's browsing your site. You may look, for example, in January of 2014 and realize that 6% of your traffic is coming from mobile. But who knows? You could have, by April, 15% of your traffic coming from mobile. It could happen by happenstance. It could happen if you were fortunate enough to be featured in the right publication, or it could be because of a specific initiative. But these things are changing all the time, and you have to stay vigilant and maintain your visibility over these metrics and over this behavior for you to do the best job in optimizing it. Now, moving on from some of the basic gimmies for uh, front-end optimization and, and basic error elimination. There's a concept in mobile called mobile first. Mobile first suggests that in order to maximize your SEO for mobile, in order to beat Google's game, you really should focus on developing a solution for mobile first because it's going to require a lot more focus and a specific context for you to consider when you're doing that design. It's far harder to take a large, sprawling uh, desktop solution and to shrink it down. And so there are different ways that you can consider going from mobile to desktop or desktop to mobile if you're forced to do so. And so right now I want to talk about responsive web design, uh, dynamic content, and then mobile redirects with adaptive sorts of implementation. So with responsive web design, this is sort of the easiest way to start mobile first, and it's one of the more popular um, approaches to implementing a, a good website experience for your desktop, tablet, and mobile users. Um, and the way that typically this would work is you would work at extremes. The first thing that you do is look at a mobile presentation and the fact that you have a very narrow viewport uh, with very small resolution and typically only a one column presentation. What is the critical content order that you want to present? Where should your call to action be? Um, there's actually a blog out there that was uh, pretty well received recently that highlighted the fact that Starbucks did a great job of creating a responsive website. However, as soon as you shrunk that site down to a mobile presentation, the call to action that on a desktop site was in the top right corner exactly where the user was looking 
went to the absolute bottom of a five-page scrolling experience so that the odds of a user finding that call to action were slim to none. So it's not just that you can implement a blanket solution for responsive web design and assume that everything's going to be fine. This takes a lot of planning. It also takes some careful consideration. Conversion rate optimization, for example, could be challenging with responsive web design. It's not going to be as easy as if you have a specific site that you want to convert to or a specific URL that you can specifically optimize for that conversion. In this case, you're typically going to have to optimize every page for every browser context and then really lean on the quality of your content and your navigation to maximize your conversions. Um, the benefit, though, is that you can really maximize your link value. So the only challenge that you would really have as far as SEO for mobile is concerned and responsive web design is ensuring that users are going to be navigating to the same pages on a mobile device so that they can be properly indexed for mobile. There's, there are some ways that you can pretty easily test this. Responsive web design is, is a really easy one to test because you can basically just pick the left or the right-hand side of your browser, even on your desktop device, and start dragging it across your screen. So if I grab the right side of my browser, I can drag it towards the left, and I'll see the responsive grid collapsing. If you go to, for example, time.com, that's one of the sites that you can see this happening on. But it's not always that easy. A lot of implementations are going to also look at what's called a user agent string, which is going to be information that's, uh, that is delivered to the browser that identifies, for example, uh, sorry, that's delivered to the server that identifies where you're coming from. So are you coming from a given device? What's your viewport size? What sort of a browser do you have? What WebKit is installed on your, on your device? And so on and so forth. And if you have intelligent code, it'll also make decisions based on that information. And so there's two browser plugins that anyone can use, any marketer, advertiser, developer, or even you know, C-level executive. If you install the user agent switcher, for example, into a Chrome browser, then you can very easily go in there and say, I now want you to report to this website that I am coming from mobile Safari, or that I'm coming from an iPhone, or that I'm coming from an Android device. And then you can watch and see how the website responds to that information when it's delivered. Um, and what you can see, for example, is I just looked at time.com and cnn.com, one next to the other, and you can see the difference between a responsive implementation and one that's not. On the left, and granted you can tell by the, the images here just how old uh, these screenshots are, but with time, you get a one-column presentation for a mobile device that really uh, does a great job of optimizing the navigation. So the navigation is customized for my small viewport. So is the image size, and so is the content. Everything flows very, very nicely. All I really have to do is read and scroll with my thumb. It's great. As opposed to CNN, where if I wanted to try to find any given menu navigation item that I would want, I have to start dragging the page over uh, to the right-hand side to find that. I might have to pinch to try to shrink the, the viewport or to shrink the page so I can see what I need to see. And then I'll be double-clicking a lot to try to zoom in so I can actually read comments. Uh, I can tell you from experience and from doing this pretty frequently because there's a lot of sites that I like to read um, that, that have not yet implemented responsive design, I will inadvertently click on an image. I'll inadvertently link to a hyperlink that I didn't mean to. Um, and especially if these solutions are popping up, for example, interstitial pages that are trying to push a mobile application solution, very often I'll be launching either the iPhone App Store or the Google Play Store um, to go out and buy or download this application when that's not what I intended to do. And so the, the usability is extremely poor when you're forcing a user to download a desktop solution onto a mobile device. And again, if you think about the research that Google did, this happens 35% of the time, and users are even selecting to do this because what they're trying to consume is so poorly implemented on a mobile device. There's a few uh, websites here that you can sort of peruse that have done a really nice job of implementing responsive web design. And when you go here, you might get some ideas for how you can do a good job implementing it yourself. But let's talk about dynamic content. Dynamic content is arguably going to be the best possible solution for the user experience, for your conversion rate optimization, and in fact, for the, for the uh, execution and the performance of a given web page on a mobile device. The problem with this is if you use a CDN solution, so Yoda provides a federated CDN offering. There are household names like Akamai that also do this for people. But the whole point of the CDN is to cache static content to eliminate geographic latency for your users. That means that if my website is hosted in Boston, 
to make it convenient. And I have a user in Singapore, let's say, who is consuming my site. I don't want them to have to connect back to a server in Boston to download that page. That would be a, a really miserable user experience and a poor connection. <coughs> what I would rather have somebody do is download cached content from a node that's local to Singapore because they'll get really snappy performance. Now, there's challenges to doing this when you have dynamic content. So for e-commerce, as soon as somebody logs in or as soon as somebody wants to go to their shopping cart, that's not cached content anymore. That's dynamic content. But when I do have some static content, a CDN is going to be a great solution. Once I start having dynamic content, though, I can't cache that anymore. And you have to consider you know, sort of an obvious reason why. If I log into Amazon, it's going to tell me, hi, Ari, you have one thing in your cart from the last time you logged in. If the CDN were to cache that information, and Alexis was the next one who was going to use Amazon.com, say, then as soon as she downloaded the site, whether she logged in or not, it's going to say, hi, Ari, you have one thing in your shopping cart. Well, that's going to be a very poor experience for Alexis, and if she were to see something like that, the likelihood that she would trust Amazon to actually complete a purchase uh, is, is slim to none. Because if you're serving up other people's content, who knows what you're doing with my personal information, who knows if I'll have a secure credit card transaction, et cetera. Um, the other challenge with dynamic content is that most web developers and, and sort of old, um, and I'll use old in quotes because this entire industry is relatively nascent, but the old sort of guard was saying that it was perfectly fine to hide content and to hide images that you're not going to display and to hide navigation items that you don't want to display instead of figuring out a way for the server not to send them at all. So while that might make your site look good on a desktop uh, uh, presentation, and if you're connected via a LAN cable or via cable at all, then you're probably going to have snappy enough performance and you won't really notice a difference. But if I'm connected over a 3G network connection, and especially if I'm in the middle of a city with a lot of tall towers and a lot of people using their cell phones, so we'll be at Penn Station in New York, then all of that extra hidden content adds weight and adds round trips to my browsing experience that are going to materially affect how I can consume my site. And so for dynamic content, if you can't stop your site from sending information and all you're doing is hiding it, this can actually be a deceptively poor decision uh, and one that will negatively impact your conversions pretty significantly. And then the last one is a mobile URL redirect. This is something that a lot of people are trying to move away from in favor of responsive web design. It can actually be a great idea if you do it properly, or it can be a very expensive way for you to, to really decimate your mobile SEO. So it really depends on how you implement a mobile URL redirect scenario. First of all, there are a lot of people, including some, some very um, popular thought leaders at Google, who would say that the number of redirects that you should maintain on any given site is exactly zero. You should not be redirecting your users because it leads to a fundamentally poor experience and a fundamentally slow experience. However, if you do have a separate, device, uh, separate solution, then that allows you to maximize that experience for the mobile user and to really optimize all the content for mobile consumption. That means lighter pages, lighter images that are more compressed and have maybe a little bit less quality, and navigation that's specifically geared towards mobile. But if you're doing it where you say, I have 1,000 pages on my desktop site, I'm only going to replicate 10 of those pages or 15 of those pages on my mobile site. And for all of the other pages, I'm going to redirect for my quote unquote mobile optimized landing page. Google is going to penalize you for that. And users are increasingly more savvy and will hate that sort of behavior. If I know that on my desktop, CNN.com, for example, I click a button and that'll take me to breaking news for world. Uh, and then I go to the mobile presentation and it takes me to welcome to CNN mobile, download our, our uh, you know, iPhone application now, then that's a really poor experience for me, and I'll be less likely to visit your site. Maybe I'll consume your, your content through an RSS reader, or maybe I'll just throw up my hands and say, you know what, it's time for me to move on to another competitor. So when you implement mobile URL redirects, you have to consider that you're going to be doing a good job with your mobile user experience and something that you personally would want to consume, and not just good enough, because good enough isn't really good enough anymore. And the other thing you have to consider is the cost of actually implementing a secondary solution. So if you have an existing e-commerce platform, if you have a web platform, if you have a hosting provider, if you are dealing with ongoing development and support and operational costs, you have to factor all of those things in and then consider what one additional property would mean to your entire infrastructure and the cost of supporting it. 
And that should really be the first driving factor for you when you decide how you're going to implement a desktop versus a mobile solution. If you're using Chrome, again, I'm just going to use Chrome because it's easy, then there's actually some really easy ways that you can determine whether you've got redirects happening and what those will look like. If you have 301 or 302 redirects, these are the things that are frequently asked about when people want to know how redirection impacts SEO. Both of them are actually fine. Neither one of them is purported to actually dilute your SEO on Google, despite the fact that there is constant debate on this topic. And their videos are a bit vague in their advice. What we've seen, and from most of the advice when you are okay, as long as it's a single redirect and it's going to a page that a user is not immediately going to bounce from, so that you have some sort of uh, reputable quality content on that site. So if you implement, for example, that redirect checker, it's going to show you something like this if you try to browse CNN from a mobile presentation. So you can see here that there was actually a chain of redirects. Um, and that is the kind of thing that you have to be wary of because, first of all, it's, it's not zero redirects, it's actually three. And then beyond that, how long does each one take, especially if my network connection is poor? So if I have a single redirect where I go to CNN.com and then it straight away sends me over to m.cnn.com, okay. But I can tell you from trying this, when it does redirect me to that site, it's a redirect and then it begins to render, then it redirects again and it begins to render, and then it redirects the third time and finally renders, and that entire experience takes over 13 seconds. That is untenable for your average user. So when you think about the ways that you're going to address just the presentation of desktop versus mobile, Again, the first question is, do you have the time, do you have the budget, and do you have the in-house skills for implementing responsive web design or mobile redirects, whatever you choose, or, or frankly, dynamic design if you decide to do that. But can you do it in-house? If you're calling it a consultant to implement something as critical as your, your public website solution, then you're going to pay for it tenfold in the future because you're going to have to continuously rely on consultants to come in and advance it or uh, rework it or to fix bugs for you. You'll rely on, you know, arguably what is going to be a very sort of uh, terse handoff from the consultant to your internal team as far as retraining and then that knowledge to carry you forward, which almost never works successfully. So it can be very, very expensive to implement these and you really have to decide if you have the budget for it. Or using a, a hosting solution that also provides this service as part of the hosting can be your best bet. It can actually in the long run be a far more economical uh, resolution to that problem. And then you have to remember that on mobile, all of your assumptions really need to be jettisoned. You have to think first and foremost about just how hard it is to maintain a consistent connection from a mobile browser over and above everything else. And then beyond it, how many applications does the user have running? How savvy are they with using the actual mobile browser? Um, what is the impact of turning the, the radio on and off for that mobile device? And how, what does that do to the user's battery life? And then finally, you know, one of the things that people often overlook is what are you doing to your mobile user's data plan? So if you've got a page that is, you know, full of eye-catching graphics and embedded audio or video, and you try to download that to a mobile site, you have to think about one other thing that isn't immediately obvious, and we'll talk about it in a moment, which is optimizing all of that content for the ways that the browsers are going to behave differently. And then the last thing that you think about here is that mobile browsers provide less feedback. So it's not just that they're slower. But when you think about a desktop browser versus a mobile browser, a desktop browser has a tab that is going to show you, you know, a progress bar or a spinner when a page is loaded. It'll probably also have a progress bar at the bottom. It'll probably also turn your mouse pointer into an hourglass or a spinning volleyball or something like that. But you have numerous ways of getting feedback from a desktop browser. From a mobile browser, you're lucky to get two ways of getting feedback. And so a lot of the time that a user is waiting when the site is actually doing something will just appear as though the website is stalled or is broken because the user won't know that there's actually something happening behind the scenes simply because the mobile browser doesn't provide a feedback mechanism to tell them. So it's really important to bear that in mind. Now, all of those things that we've been talking about so far are arguably um, in the weeds and things that you're really going to let IT manage. Uh, even though CMOs and marketing departments are getting increasingly more involved in every aspect of website development um, and, and long-term maintenance. But the thing that really most conversion marketers, most e-commerce managers are focused on is what the site looks like and what that engagement is like for the user. 
Some people have called it hyper-local, some people mobile, other people are just saying that it's the cost of doing business to have eye-catching images, a lot of JavaScript, localization and personalization, down to reviews, down to embedded maps, uh, and so on and so forth. When you look at the, the content that actually creates the majority of slowdowns, the majority of problems for mobile sites, it's images. 70% of the content on your average page is going to be images, followed closely by scripts, where scripts would be things like uh, style sheets, which we've actually broken out separately here, but they can be, because uh, jQuery can be implemented, for example, as a way to dynamically show content on a page. But beyond that, it's going to be things like Marketo, so that you can track access to the page, or the Google Analytics JavaScript tracking. Uh, if you want to do A-B testing through Optimizely, if you want to include Facebook likes or, or Google Plus Ones or anything like that into your page, those are additional scripts that have to be downloaded and executed before the page is done loading. But if we look first and foremost at images, there are actually different ways you can implement images. So a lot of the modern frameworks that give you an admin console are going to apply optimizations themselves to basically keep you from hurting yourself. But when you try to, to, to plan for images that you're going to upload to your site, realize that at a very high level, there are different types of encoding for images that are going to make a material difference in how the image looks, but also how much it weighs and how much it performs. There are new standards called WebP that are you know, gaining in adoption but are not universally adopted yet. So if you have the ability to define code that's robust enough to serve up a WebP image when it is supported by a browser, then that can be a great way to improve performance for those users. But more realistically, what you really want to do is to try to compress it down to the lowest quality that you can afford to without impacting the way that the user consumes that image. So here's an example of a side-by-side -side image where one image is actually twice the size, and I don't mean obviously in scale, I mean in weight of the other. The one on the left is actually over a megabyte in size, the one on the right is several K in size, and you can really only recognize the difference if you're sitting there scrutinizing the images. If you're the average e-commerce user or shopper and you see a number of images like the one on the right on a page, it really won't be something that's readily apparent that these images have all been compressed on uh, your site effectively and quickly. So if you think about which solution is right for you here, again, when you're talking about optimizing images and optimizing the content of a page to eliminate round trip requests, to wait, to optimize your images through compression, then you really want to consider using third parties for this as well. Doing it yourself typically doesn't make sense. Even high-powered developers are more likely to go out and download a, a third-party solution uh, to accomplish this than they are to try to write it themselves. But it's not just about whether there's a third-party solution that does this, it's also when you do it. So there are three ways that you can apply optimizations to your site. One is to apply them at development time. That means that while you're going through putting your website pages together, going through all of the design iterations, applying the CSS, looking at the proportions, and really dialing in your site, you can apply the web optimizations then. Arguably, this is the, the best time to do it because you can work this into your culture and you can ensure that everything that you turn out is optimized. But you could also argue that this is one of the worst times to apply these optimizations because it materially impacts the amount of time it takes for you to deploy a solution in the first place. So if I want to have a website that's out to market, let's say, in the next month, and I have to factor in the optimization effort during that month while I'm actually developing the page, the odds that I'll have effective time for last minute tweaks and polish and, and really good QA will diminish exponentially because it takes time to apply these optimizations and you have to do a lot of testing while you're applying them to make sure that you're actually affecting change in the right way. Now you can also apply these optimizations at deployment time, which means that you would create your entire website solution and get it so that it looks the way you want it to. And then when you're ready to deploy it, for example, to a staging environment to test it, that's when you would start to employ all of the, the front-end optimizations and other optimizations for the platform. So your IT team or your IT service provider or even your framework may, when you actually ship the product, when you build it from the code that you've arrived at, it will then run all of the images through a compression mechanism. It'll run all of your files through something that'll try to combine them and to strip out all the white space. But the problem with that approach is that it makes you reliant on your testing process really being the last thing you do and not an integral part of development. And the reason for that is if you apply all of these optimizations at the 
deployment time, what you've deployed is different than what you've developed. So now, if I'm trying to troubleshoot a problem that I realize in staging, I won't see the same code that I saw in development. So I'm going to have to basically go back into my code, try to recreate the problem before I applied all of the, the deployment time optimizations, and see if I can arrive at the root cause of the problem then. It simply lengthens the time. The third thing that you can do is actually apply these optimizations at delivery time to your users, and that's what solutions like Yoda does. Uh, that's what also solutions like, for example, Akamai would do, or anybody else that has a CDN solution or something that provides a SaaS or cloud-based FEO implementation. While the bits are being delivered to your users, you actually optimize the content at that time. And it's important to remember that these optimizations are there because your users on mobile devices are not going to have consistent connections, they're not going to have the same horsepower that they would have on a desktop, and they don't have as much real estate, so the browser is far less forgiving. And then the last thing is, you are going to have to continuously apply these optimizations because the work is, is still very much in progress. There are new discoveries being made daily or weekly uh, into how you can uh, optimize images on the new formats that are available for you to use, and even with the ways uh, that we're trying to standardize the W3C of how you're writing this code and how the browsers implement them. So the, the real takeaways from this entire presentation are that you really need to preach and live this gospel. You shouldn't be doing yourself what a tool can do for you. In all cases, when you weigh the cost benefit of applying any optimizations or any mobile initiative, you have to consider whether you can relatively inexpensively and repeatedly buy yourself uh, to the solution. You also can't blindly trust the tools. You have to keep a vigilant eye through testing. That has to include both your business side testing through Google Analytics or Omniture. It has to include web performance testing or something else, like even you physically grabbing a mobile device and going for a walk at lunchtime trying to navigate through your site to make sure it's working correctly. Um, and then you have to have a good relationship with whoever's doing the IT maintenance for your site so they understand that it is an ongoing iterative process to maximize the end user experience and the performance of that solution. So Yoda has a number of solutions available. Um, the folks at Percussion I know are also dedicated to providing the best possible experience for their users. So you can check out some of these tools and obviously also Yoda.com and Percussion.com for tips and tricks. And beyond that, um, I'd like to jump into some of the Q&A. So Alexis, if we've got questions, let's, uh, let's try to address some of those. Great, Ari. Thank you very much. Those are some fabulous stats. I was tweeting them the whole time, so thank you. Um, so we have a few questions from the audience. But before I begin, I would like to put a friendly reminder out there. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat window or the question window. I'm happy to uh, ask the questions for, for you throughout the presentation. Um, so to, to get started, uh, the first question I have is, do I have to worry about Google's mobile algorithm or its impact on SEO if I do not have a mobile site? So absolutely. It's a great question, and you certainly do. Um, one of the things that I've mentioned a few times is that you know, 35% of users are going to jump to a desktop site when they're given the alternative. That doesn't actually look at the number of users who are, as a matter of course, going to try to force themselves into a desktop presentation. But regardless of even the industry standard metrics, for you yourself, what you should realize about your website solution is if you plan for mobile or not, people are increasingly using mobile. And all you really have to do is go to a playground, a train station, a mall, and you'll see evidence of it everywhere you go. So planning for mobile. Uh, is an absolute necessity, and just basically ignoring the, the mobile you know, optimizations or creating a mobile solution for your company is not going to stop people from trying to get there on a mobile device. So yes, it's absolutely critical. Perfect. So um, leading into that, we have another great question. Um, I don't have a mobile site. How can I get started? So one of the things that you should consider is that a lot of the framework providers, a lot of the platforms out there, um, will actually provide you with a mobile solution out of the box so that you don't actually have to do a lot of this work yourself at all. The, the most important thing that you can do to create a mobile site is to really plan for what would your site look like if it were displayed on a very tiny screen. Uh, and it really, that's, that's a dramatic oversimplification, but logically that's really all you have to consider. What content is the user uh, going to be presented, or what do you need them to have presented above the fold when you have a very small viewport available to you, and then what should their navigation experience be like? And then I can say that our friends over at HubSpot, for example, have built into 
their CMS platform the ability for a user to get a responsive website as a matter of course. So you build your solution on HubSpot and it becomes a responsive solution um, for you. So the really important thing that you need to do is just think about what your content looks like on mobile and then when you shop around either for upgrading or modernizing your infrastructure or starting a new website, uh, a lot of times you can get it for effectively free. Perfect. Thank you, Ari. Um, so I have one final question here. Um, so, and I definitely resonate with this. This could be a lot of work for me to address. What's the most important update I can make now? I'd say the most important thing that you can guarantee is that you don't have errors on your website um, and that you're not trying to force people to a single page if they come from a mobile site. So that sounds like two things and not one, but from an end user perspective, it's gonna feel like one big error. So if I'm on a mobile site and the pages are timing out when I go there, that's an error. That could be due to all sorts of things like a DNS problem or time to first byte problem, but I don't know that as a user. The browser certainly isn't telling me. All I know is that I didn't get what I wanted. The same thing is true as if I try to follow a, a hyperlink that somebody emailed me where maybe, you know, uh, the marketing, uh, the VP of marketing was on a site on their desktop and they emailed me something and I'm on my iPhone traveling for work and I click on the link and it takes me to a 404 page or it takes me to a page that isn't what the, the VP of marketing told me I was going to see when I click on the link. That's going to feel like an error. And then finally, if you think about how you're trying to build SEO, you want to try to avoid fighting against yourself because if Google tries to crawl your site and Google is simply coming across 404s, or 500 errors or any other really non-200 or 300 level response from your website, it's going to count against not only your user experience but also the ability for users to find you in the first place. And it's a really easy thing for you to do to search for a website crawler uh, or find 404s and you'll get basically the, uh, the phone book as far as solutions that will help you at least identify where those 404s are, and then there's a lot of prescriptive advice from Google and other folks on simple ways that you can make uh, rewrite rules even work for you to eliminate those 404s altogether. Wonderful. That was really helpful. Well, Ari, I would like to thank you for presenting on today's webinar. We greatly appreciate it. Um, for those who attended, thank you for attending as well. The slides uh, will be emailed to you after today's presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to tweet us at Percussion or at Yoda. So thank you for your time, and we hope you have a great day.